I do buy. Honey, there comes a time when you start to notice things about your body. Mom, I'm 20. It's these elbows. You need Jergens Ultra Healing Lotion. So smooth. Okay, let's work on your feet. Mom, and try energizing citrus body butter. Jergens. Look, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler are at their best when their jokes are funny, fierce, and they hit the bullseye a number of times. Oh, yeah, like every single time. Happening now. Today, the Spurs organization announcing fans can return to the AT&T Center after a year of being empty for games. We're going to tell you when tickets go on sale, how they're going to keep people safe, and the precautions you need to take before you go to a game. Asylum seekers stuck in Mexico for months are slowly being allowed into the U.S. Coming up, how a city in the Rio Grande Valley is playing a big role in this process. A few lingering showers left over on the radar screen. We'll take a close look at those, how much rain fell and where today, along with some warmer temperatures later this week. I'll see you in a few minutes. And we'll have a preview of never seen before Alamo artifacts that will soon be on display, donated by singer and Alamo enthusiast Phil Collins. The News at 5 starts right now. And for the first time in more than a year, our San Antonio Spurs will allow a limited amount of fans to return to the AT&T Center. It will take place on March the 12th in the Spurs' first home game after the All-Star break and over a year since the COVID-19 pandemic shut down all of sports. With more on this milestone, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. It will be great to have everyone back in the AT&T Center. The last time a crowd was allowed in the AT&T Center was on March the 10th, 2020, when the Spurs beat the Dallas Mavericks. Two days later, the NBA shut down and all of major sports soon followed due to the outbreak of the coronavirus. On March the 12th, the Spurs will welcome back a limited amount of fans, about 3,200 to be exact, as they ease into the COVID-19 recovery period as cases are on their way down and vaccines are now being provided. The first home game to start the second half of the Spurs season will be against the Orlando Magic, and that will be one of 17 chances during the rest of the regular season to the Spurs live and to ensure fan safety the spurs will continue to use germ logic to prevent the spread of numerous viruses and air purification units i think it's been difficult for all of us but the uh the nba did a great job of creating a, a pretty safe environment for us in the bubble but there's nothing like playing with fans and the, the atmosphere in the, in the arenas is just going to be so much different than anything we've had. Not only that, but the relationships that we have with our people and our fans and our players and, and the relationship that they have, we've all missed. All right, and here are some new rules you'll have to follow in the process. You must wear a mask when you're not eating or drinking. Complete health screening before you arrive at the game. Temperature checks at the door. Social distancing at all times, even in elevators. Cashless and touchless payments, even for parking using the Spurs app. To make sure it all runs smoothly, the Spurs have upgraded the AT&T Center with the fastest 5G and Wi-Fi 6 technology. Coming up in sports, we'll get you ready for tonight's game against Brooklyn. All right, thank you, Greg. Meantime, asylum seekers stuck in Mexico for months during the Trump administration are slowly being allowed into the U.S. Thousands of migrants were forced to wait in Mexico under the program known as the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP. That was initiated in 2019. Tiffany Huertas has more on the asylum seekers arriving in the city of Brownsville in the Rio Grande Valley. <laughs> Dozens of asylum seekers arrived in Brownsville last week. The mayor of Brownsville, Trey Mendez, says they have been working closely with President Joe Biden's administration. You know, the priority is, is getting the individuals that have been in that camp in Matamoros uh, over, and that's going to be about 700. We intend to do that within the next 10 to 14 days. Mendez says people are coming from Cuba and different countries in Central and South America. We are going to thank God. Thank you to all the beautiful people that never left us without food in Matamoros. When this migrant protection protocol program was put in place prior to that, uh, individuals that were seeking asylum could wait in the United States for their court dates. Once the MPP was put in place, then those individuals were, uh, were asked to remain in Mexico. The mayor says people that have been staying in the camp have been getting health checks prior to crossing. Once they cross, then they get their, we get their information, help them make travel arrangements, and then um, get them to their sponsor, to their family as quickly as we can. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security says there's approximately 25,000 people in the MPP program with active cases. And this administration is certainly a lot different than previous one. 
And uh, like I said, we'll see over time how this new policy works, but I'm confident we're going to see some, some very positive changes. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says it is currently constructing a facility in Eagle Pass to help accommodate migrants in its custody. The agency says based on past experience, evaluation of operational requirements and challenges due to COVID-19 space restrictions, it needs additional processing facilities when it sees rising numbers of encounters. Coming up at 6, we take a look at the facility in Carrizo Springs that has reopened for migrant children that has drawn criticism from immigration advocates. So what happens now in the wake of last month's weather related power crisis? CPS Energy trustees voted to conduct an independent review of the utilities preparedness communication. It's management reaction. They still need to hire someone to do the review and a timeline is unclear. There was discussions over whether CPS Energy staff could simultaneously comply with this review and another wider review conducted by a city committee. I would ask that as we narrow the scope and seek a um, consultant or whoever will help us with this review internally, that we coordinate that with uh, Chairman Williams um, to get his input on that to make sure that we are coordinated and aligned. The CPS Energy Board still meeting right now. They're expected to discuss whether to approve up to half a billion dollars in short term financing. Now that move appears to be a way to help finance the high fuel costs incurred during the power crisis. Other top stories today, San Antonio police say they were having a tough time finding suspects or even a witness to a stabbing at a gas station this morning. It happened around 630 in the parking lot of Love's truck stop near I-35 and Fisher Road. The victim, a 37 year old man, told officers he was attacked by another man as he walked across the parking lot being stabbed once in the chest. The victim was rushed to the hospital. His current condition is not known right now. Police say there were several people sleeping in their vehicles at the truck stop, but none of them saw anything. It is believed the suspect fled in a vehicle, but no other details are avail available. New details today about a man who was involved in an hours long standoff with Bear County Sheriff's deputies yesterday. 55 year old Salvador Salvador Gonzalez is facing charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon on a public servant. This after a standoff started around 2 p.m. at a home in West Bear County. An arrest affidavit says Gonzalez was arguing with his wife while carrying around an AR-15 rifle. BCSO says that he later pointed that rifle at a deputy multiple times before hiding inside his home. At one point saying he was going to die and was, quote, taking officers with him, end quote. He eventually surrendered, was taken to the hospital for mental health treatment. Well, there's a new weapon in the fight against COVID-19. After getting the green light from the FDA, Johnson & Johnson shipped out the first batch of its new one-dose vaccine this morning. Just under 4 million doses of the newly approved vaccine are now making their way around the country. And within 48 hours, Johnson & Johnson says Americans should start getting those doses. Leading health experts are urging all eligible Americans to get whichever vaccine they can. All three vaccines are safe and highly effective at preventing what we care about most, and that's very serious illness and death. While a third vaccine is encouraging, the head of the CDC has issued a warning to stay vigilant after the recent decline in new COVID-19 infections has leveled off, saying, quote, at this level of cases with variants spreading, we stand to completely lose the hard earned ground we have gained. While having a third vaccine available seems to be great news, some health experts worry Americans may turn up their noses at the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. CNN's Mandy Gaither has more on why some say vaccine comparisons just aren't fair. It's the latest weapon in the war on COVID-19, but in global trials, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine had a slightly lower efficacy rate than the other two on the U.S. market fueling concerns that some may not want to get the one dose shot. There are advantages and disadvantages of all the vaccines, and actually it's hard to compare them side by side because they were tested at different times. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine was tested in South Africa, where a variant believed to be more contagious was first identified. 
There, the vaccine showed a 64% efficacy overall. But in the U.S., the vaccine showed a 72% overall efficacy rate. And against severe forms of the disease, it's even higher, offering nearly 86% protection. The endpoint that I think really matters is the endpoint of preventing severe disease, especially severe enough disease that causes hospitalization and death, because ultimately that's what we care about. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine may also be effective against asymptomatic infection, but more research needs to be done. It's a small data set looking at asymptomatic transmission, but it does give increasing evidence that getting the vaccine prevents you not just from getting sick yourself, but probably also reduces your chance of spreading the virus to others too. So when it comes to which vaccine you should choose, whatever vaccine is made available to you. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Well, back here at home, a huge opportunity for historians and Alamo enthusiasts alike. Alamo officials are gearing up to showcase the Phil Collins collection. The Alamo will display a preview filled with artifacts donated by musician and Alamo buff Phil Collins starting on Texas Independence Day, which is tomorrow. The temporary exhibit, which includes a brass cannon used by the Mexican Army, also features some lesser known items, some which give us insight into the planning of the battle. One of the showstoppers is actually Santana's battle orders from March 5th, 1836, in which he gives every unit in the Mexican army their, basically their instructions for the attack. And so we're lucky to have that piece of paper that still survives in our collection. The exhibit will be on display until April 25th and will be available for guests who purchase an audio tour, which is just $7 per person. Breezy, cool, and cloudy outside today. You see those low clouds across the Alamo City. We're looking at 410 westbound there, and of course looking at the airport as well. Clouds, they're in place. We did have a few showers here and there, but not over San Antonio. Nothing officially in the rain gauge at the airport. Take a look at our high temperature today. We only topped out at 61 degrees this afternoon, and that was brief. We're back down in the 50s right now. Weather watchers mostly in the 50s as well. We're looking at 52 in Lakey, 55 right now in Bernie, 54 in Seguin. And you head up into uh, Bernie. Rick's backyard had a third of an inch of rain. We'll take a look at some of the other rainfall accumulations coming up in a few minutes and our future rainfall. Till then, breezy through the night, near 50 degrees at midnight. We're going to talk about some warmer weather as well coming up. Thank you, Adam. A new leadership in hopes of moving forward with the stalled Alamo redevelopment project. Mayor Ron Nuremberg replacing several key people involved in the project. Councilman Roberto Trevino, who serves as the city's representative on the Alamo Management Committee and as a tri-chair of the Citizens, Citizens Advisory Committee, has been replaced with Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran. Trevino has been on the project for six years. City Attorney Andy Segovia will replace City Manager Eric Walsh on the Management Committee. Nirenberg also made several other appointments to the Citizens Advisory Committee. The $450 million project has been in limbo since the Texas Historic Commission denied the relocation of the Cenotaph last year. The city had said the relocation was key to the design. In a memo to City Council, the mayor said the project will need to be reworked now that the Cenotaph is staying put. We'll have full coverage on this and latest developments on what happens next coming up tonight on the Night Beat at 10. The Medical Board of California now investigating this guy, a plastic surgeon who appeared before a judge for a traffic violation via Zoom while he was operating on a patient. A look at that incredible video coming up next. So many of us by now have used Zoom to virtually attend work, school, other important events, logging in from home or wherever we may be. But one California surgeon took that a step further, virtually attending traffic court while he had a patient under the knife. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez reports from L.A. Are you uh, available for trial? It, it kind of looks like you're in an operating room right now. <laughs> I am, sir. I'm in an operating room. Yes, I'm available for trial. For right Scrubbed now. in and in the middle of an operation, this California plastic surgeon logging into Zoom for traffic court, leaving the presiding judge in disbelief. So unless I'm mistaken, I'm seeing a defendant that's in the middle of an operating room appearing to be actively engaged in providing services to a patient. Is that correct, Mr. Green? 
Yes, sir. The trial broadcast live on YouTube, showing Sacramento-based surgeon Dr. Scott Green sworn in by the clerk with what appears to be blood on his surgical gloves. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. At one point, Green seems to be focused on surgery. His head down with medical equipment no, uh, beeping in the background. I do not feel comfortable uh, for the welfare of a patient if you're in the process of operating. I have another surgeon right here who's doing the surgery with me, so I can stand here and allow them to do the surgery also. Not at all. I'm, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's appropriate. I think the judge cutting off the proceeding. Let me see if I can get a different date here. I apologize, Your Honor, to the court. Sometimes and surgery doesn't always go as... The court. As you know, it we happens. Go. We want to keep people healthy. We want to keep them alive. That's that's important. Experts say now Green could face legal action. With respect to his medical license, the issue is whether there was a violation of the standard of care. Additionally, the patient might have their own lawsuit for medical malpractice. The Medical Board of California tells ABC News it's aware of this incident and will look into it. I called Dr. Green's office and was told by a staff member they have no comment. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Unbelievable. I'm wow. in a state of shock after watching that story. Wow. I wouldn't think that's going to help the guy's business. No. Could you imagine just, oh, sorry, guys. I just, I got to take this uh, Zoom call right now. No, bad for you know, the patient. Gotta, My so, yeah, exactly. Jeez. Uh, all right. These stories, I tell you, yeah. keep coming out. So breezy through the night, warmer tomorrow, and a dry forecast in store. And we could use the rainfall. I'll show you the newest drought monitor coming up in a moment. But let's talk about the rain that we actually had today. Take a look at this. We had a few streaky showers, especially north of town earlier today. There's that one swath from about Myco Lake Hills area to Bernie, northeastward into Blanco County, where we had upwards of an inch of rain. But this right here, when we zoom into the Bernie area, really illustrates the haves and have nots with rainfall. You're looking at downtown Bernie, near River Road on the south side of downtown, a tenth to two tenths of an inch. But then you get to the, you go up Main Street a little bit north, more farther to the north, and even I 10 corridor, eight tenths of an inch to nearly an inch. So very striking contrast there just over that short distance in the Bernie area. You look off to the east and eh, well, some locations were lucky. They were fortunate in Lavaca County up to a quarter to three tenths of an inch, even in parts of Gonzales County and Cuero uh, area. DeWitt County seemed very similar. So we didn't have a whole lot of activity, but where we did, at least it counted for some folks. And the clouds are still lingering, still some areas of rain far to the east of San Antonio, right along the Gulf Coast line and the coastal plain there. And that's all moving out of town. It's not going to last much longer. But look at the last 12 hours here. This is nice to see good coverage across the state, not just in terms of rain, but Oh yes, a little bit of snow in West Texas today on the colder side of this upper level circulation. And what's causing this moisture or this rain and creating the showers out of that moisture is this upper level circulation, which is going to be pushing eastward and on its backside, we're looking at sunshine as we get into tomorrow. I mentioned the drought monitor and I like to show you that coverage of moisture across the state, especially in West Texas. That's where we need it the most and we did get a little bit today. Even the Dallas area got some much needed rainfall around here. Yeah, we could obviously use it. Unfortunately, we didn't cash in on a whole lot across South Texas, especially down in the valley where they're in an extreme drought right now. Moving forward, rain chances, pretty slim. I mean, we're talking slim to none. There really isn't a shot at rainfall over the next seven days. We had plenty of cloud cover today, but not much real moisture to show for it. 54 right now, dew point of 42. Here's the key, though. The winds out of the north steady at 15, gusting to 31. Get used to these wind gusts through the night. It's going to be just as breezy and gusty. Wind gusts up to 30, so a breezy night in store. Temperature wise, now for the most part, we're in the 50s. Catula in exception at 60 and Del Rio at 64. Tomorrow morning, a bit of a chill in the air. OK, nothing like two weeks ago, but a bit of a chill in the air. Low to mid 40s for most of us and some 30s in the hill country. Wouldn't surprise me if some of the typically cooler parts of the hill country briefly hit freezing tomorrow morning. But 41 Leon Springs, Timberwood Park, 41 La Soya, 42 in the morning. Then by the afternoon, 
we're back into the 60s tomorrow. So lower 60s, still a bit of a breeze at times out of the north. A lot of sunshine by Wednesday, 70 Thursday, 72. If you don't like this cloudy and cool weather, the rest of the week is for you. Looks great. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. All right. Spurs back in action tonight against one of the hottest teams yeah. in the NBA. Yeah, and they were hoping to have Keldon Johnson back tonight, but we just got an update on his condition going forward. When we come back, the Spurs host the Brooklyn Nets tonight. They'll also be down one of their big star players, and J.J. Watt is headed to Arizona. Our San Antonio Spurs return to the court tonight to host one of the beasts of the East, the Brooklyn Nets, in one of their final three games for the All-Star break. They will host the Nets tonight before seeing the Knicks tomorrow and then wrapping up with Oklahoma City on Thursday before the All-Star break begins on Friday. The Nets will be without their superstar, Kevin Durant, since he has been shut down by the team to help a strain hamstring heal. But they will have James Harden, Kyrie Irving for the Spurs. They're coming off a big win over the Pelicans Saturday night, 117-114. to Thanks to the return of DeMar DeRozan, who scored 32 points, dished out 11 assists in his first game back since the death of his father. While the Spurs were scheduled to get Keldon Johnson back soon from quarantine, it won't be tonight. They are also down still another four players, including Rudy Gay, Derek White, uh, Devin Vassell, and Quindary Weatherspoon. We've been doing really well. Um, you know, from practice to going on to the games, we've been handling it very professionally and um, just dialing down. We know that we're missing some key pieces, you know, Derek White, Keldon Johnson, you know, Rudy Gay, and Devin, so... Um, we, we know how hard it's going to be, um, so we know we have to double down and, and tap in and play the right way. All right, tip time tonight, 7.30. Highlights for you tonight on the Night Beat. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. J.J. Watt is signing with the Arizona Cardinals. How do we know this? J.J. told us himself with this tweet this morning of him working out in a Cardinals jersey with the caption, Source Me. Watt will join former Texans teammate DeAndre Hopkins on the Cardinals after he was traded by former head coach and general manager Bill O'Brien. Hopkins had been openly campaigning for Watt to join him and Arizona, and now that reunion has been solidified. Watt requested and was granted his release from the Texans last month after 10 years in Houston. Now he wants to play for a Super Super Bowl contender. According to ESPN, the five-time Pro Bowler inked a two-year deal worth $31 million with $23 million guaranteed. Tiger Woods tweeting out his appreciation over the weekend after a number of golfers participating in the WGC Workday Championship wore his trademark red on Sunday for the final round, showing their support for the 15-time major winner is recovering from a horrible car accident in California that left serious injuries to his right leg. Tiger tweeting now from his hospital room in Los Angeles, it is hard to explain how touching today was when I turned on the TV and saw all the red shirts to every golfer and every fan you're truly helping me get through this very tough time and of course we send all of our best wishes to tiger to get him back on that golf course as soon as possible great gesture by his fellow players indeed yeah thank you greg we'll be right back Tomorrow, warming up a bit, we'll have sunshine. We'll be back in the lower 60s for an afternoon high temperature. And then by Wednesday, back up to 70. And it looks like we'll stay right there, nearing in the low 70s through the remainder of the work week. But a little breezy on Friday as a week. And as you can see, uneventful cold front hits. Thank you, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 5. World News up next. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock.